Yeah, so <clears throat> here we go. <clears throat> so uh, uh, my talk today is about the Northeast Storage Exchange. This is a. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so this is a collaboration between Boston University, that's where I'm from, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern University, and the University of uh, University of Massachusetts Systems. We'll talk about, so we're uh, we are a similar project to our series, but we're younger, we just started essentially. Um, our, our network engineer has just been hired a few weeks ago. We're, we're just getting going. So I'm going to talk about the context for this project, what we hope to do, and why we're doing it. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the potential for growth, the status of things as they are right now, and um, more about um, the, the, the Actually, really, really about the motivation for Nessi itself, and Nessi sitting within a system, a cyber infrastructure that we that we are planning to build in the Middle East. Um, yeah, in fact, a lot of these issues is being this are going to be discussed in the meeting that we're having actually on June 30th uh, in Boston. This is called HPC Futures, and this is really a meeting. One of the main points is to discuss cyber infrastructure in the whole world east, where that's going with, it, with uh, it's actually similar to the symposium in that sense. And that we're considering all the advances and the changes in technology of uh, Internet of Things, uh, all the, all the, the, the big data institutes, especially big changes in uh, biotechnology, uh, gene sequencing, advances have a lot of big effect on, on our region in, in particular as we see. And uh, we'll get we'll get to we'll get to that as we go along. But uh, this meeting is coming up and uh, it's gonna be quite interesting and if you're interested in coming to it, it's mainly a regional meeting, but if you're interested in coming to it, come and see me and uh, I'll get you a meeting thing. Okay, so <clears throat> another part of the context of the project is where we're putting Nessie. And Nessie is being put in this secret place in Western Massachusetts that very few people know about. But this is this building here contains uh, research computing facilities for Boston University, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern University, and all five campuses of the University of Massachusetts system. Um, it's a 15 megawatt facility, 90,000 square feet, 70 percent hydroelectric and solar. There's space power room for about 800 racks. There's space at the site for a second building, which I'm planning to try to get them to go as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I think a good way to think about this is to, I always introduce this by thinking about the Pacific Research Platform. If you go to the NSF talks, very often they talk about the Pacific <coughs> Research Platform because they funded it and they, they are proud of it as they should be. It spans the whole Pacific coast of the United States, from Washington to Mexico, it has some of the finest universities in the world on it, Caltech is on it, Stanford is on it, 100 gigabits everywhere. It's a wonderful thing. But now I'd like you to imagine taking the whole thing and putting it in a box and shrinking the box, shrinking the box, and keep shrinking it until it's the size of the building. And then compare this box to this box. So the comparison is they're actually amazingly comparable boxes. So this box has Caltech Stanford in it, but this box has MIT and Harvard. This box has other elite institutions in it, like the uh, uh, University of Washington, for instance. This box has other elite institutions like Boston University in it. This box has one big state university system, California. This box has one big state university system in it, Massachusetts. The number of institutions is actually, it's, it's, it's both, it, they're, they're quite similar, sort of 10 to 12 ish. But in the, even the student populations, the width of the line of the student population, the student populations is also similar. So this thing here is really very much like the Pacific Research Platform on a single core. And if you're thinking about building regional cyber infrastructure, it's hard to imagine a better place <clears throat> to start than, than this building. And it's hard to imagine a better place to put a large shared storage facility in 
this building. So we think so this is where we're putting Nessie. And um, partially because of this location, I think it has it has uh, uh, enormous and unique potential to, to grow over time and to not just be a research facility, but, but to to be a, a, a growing and permanent part of the infrastructure of these universities and and and, and this is also motivation to grow, to, to grow the consortium that we're all going to talk about doing. Okay, so yeah, this was funded. So this project was funded by NSF, and here's our here's the founding uh, uh, PI, James Cow. Um, and yeah, I think I've said all this stuff already. This is our Slack channel. <laughs> you can see crystals on a crystal. Now, what is the potential for growth? <clears throat> now, um, I'm also, uh, besides being in the Messi project, I'm also in charge of the Northeast Tier 2 Center, which is a center just like Sean's Center. And this is one of four centers in the United States that provide bulk of the computing <clears throat> for the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. They're, they're big facilities, so, and they're all roughly about the same size. So, for instance, in this facility I have Six petabytes of storage in GPFS and about 9,000 cores in worker nodes. This is actually a joint project between Boston University and Harvard. And this is built up, has been built up over time. <clears throat> I typically spend about $150,000 a year on storage hardware. And to have that amount of storage in, in Amazon would cost about probably speaking a million dollars. Way, way out of the question to, to you. Cloud storage for what we're doing. So, and even if I could afford that, it wouldn't work because I need multiple hundreds of gigabits per second from the storage to the worker node that way. So, um, <clears throat> now if something like Nessie appears, of course, this immediately makes total sense to me since I'm at this facility as well. I can just use, I can just migrate my storage into Nessie. And since it's on a single floor, it's totally easy to have as much bandwidth as you want, although this is any two parts of the floor. And so because the storage will appear, it makes sense, it makes more sense to put the put the, to once we do the networking right, adding the storage, uh, so you'll see the same the same consideration. So so you can see the consideration just from this is my own my own project, but this is one of many, many projects you can well imagine. So here, for instance, is Harvard Research Computing, just one of the institutions at this place. And Harvard has <clears throat> 35 petabytes of storage lying around in various different racks, managed in various different ways. And all this stuff is was managed by James Cup. It's now been headed off to Scott Yokel and his 20 FTE team to take care of all this. This is essentially research computing for all of Harvard University. And I asked <coughs> Scott, would you like to migrate this 35 petabytes of storage into Nessie to get Nessie up and, up and going? And he said, yes, yes, we really want to do that. So you can start to see the potential. Um, this, this, is a, this is another, um, and besides the potential, there's an enormous need coming up. You probably all know this, but we'll have to, this is some, just some visceral um, indicators of that. So this is one professor we can. <clears throat> Jeffrey Lickman, he's at Harvard, and, and uh, James Cup does uh, uh, doing his story. So this guy <clears throat> does uh, neurobiology. He's got a set of 61 electron microscopes that produce his data 24-7, and he needs to store it in the day. The amount of data he produces is 3 terabytes every single hour, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's like you can almost hire somebody to just Put in three terabyte drives continuously as go, just to keep up with this guy. And that's one guy. So here's from my Facebook feed. This is Chip Rock, friend of mine. Uh, he's pointing out, hey, the LHC is starting again, except the luminosity is way up. I think the data set is going to be <clears throat> larger by a factor of five. Um, of course, Michigan, I, I learned a lot of interesting things about the University of Michigan at the beginning of this. I didn't know you guys were um, at pre-ARPANET uh, internet. Okay. 
One of the things you have, which almost all the, all the universities have these days, is a big data science and so all these data science initiatives are going to come to be, are coming online. There's going to be a big demand for a large amount of storage. Here is the Internet of Things is coming. This is one of my colleagues at Boston University, and he invented actually a a whole new field called network physiology. It turns out that if you take your body and if you measure um, if you measure at the same time your heartbeat, your brain, brain waves, skin conductivity everywhere, muscle tension everywhere, kidney function. He did that, and then he noticed that you can get extremely important clinical information about disease, whether somebody's in trouble, whether somebody's not in trouble. And this has been this was like this was a uh, cover story of uh, Nature magazine. All, all all sorts of hospitals in Boston are interested in deploying this immediately in, in their hospital settings. So this is really an Internet of Things problem. And if, if you ever, if, I'm sure you've gone to a hospital and you can see all the instruments there, beeping things with scans and so on. Um, and he pointed out to me that all the data is thrown away. Nobody ever thinks it's not stored. But <clears throat> so a lot of things have to happen to make this work. You have to have an Internet of Things that's detecting all these things. You have to store this. You have to analyze this. And that whole setup is completely non-existent. And if this works really well, there's every, every hospital is going to do this. And possibly even the largest thing of all is the little fact that DNA sequencing is needing more as well by a huge amount. So over time, you know, the information around this, there's a tremendous amount of information around it. It's almost all in DNA sequence. And as people get the ability to sequence more and more, there's going to be an absolute flood of data coming uh, for people who want to catalog. So there's lots and lots of motivations to make really big stories. And our strategy, therefore, <clears throat> is to go really big. That's what I'm trying to do. So, so we have enough funding for about, we figure about 20 petabytes of storage. But um, I'm going to be very disappointed if we're not at least 100 petabytes by the end of the four year period. And uh, I think it's reasonable to hope that we can go, go much bigger than that. So, we're planning, roughly speaking, to have production pools and clusters for universities, projects like the Northeast Tier 2, this Tier 2 Center that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we'll, we're planning to participate in uh, national consortium federations, the Dataverse, <coughs> we're going to participate in the Dataverse project. We're kind of anticipating smaller pools where we, smaller pools where you put, you may put the old equipment that's used for, used for courses, for testing, university of Red Hat software. Um, we're, we're also, we've already actually got, uh, we're, we're planning smaller clusters for reference architecture. So Red Hat, we've been talking to Red Hat. Red Hat is in Boston. Um, in Boston. And uh, they're interested in setting up reference architectures for, for set with Hadoop on top of it and various other, you know, uh, big data analytics, things on top of it, testing it, and then selling it to people, and then giving us the hardware. So things like that may be happening. We're collaborating with people who are doing, who right now are doing, uh, are testing set clusters with special caching, special type of rack caching. And I'm anticipating that we're going to have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, research -y test clusters uh, alongside um, highly stable, highly reliable um, production systems. And this is just how we divided ourselves into, into teams to work on the project so far. <coughs> um, are, we're roughly speaking on point four of this of this list. So we hired a lead engineer just a few weeks ago. We had space power deployments for, for the initial the initial test deployment. The test deployment is up and running. We have uh, uh, we're going to do also we're going to do uh, an Atlas EDM endpoint. Um, and and once that is working, we're planning to migrate the system. Our six petabytes of storage from the Northeast Tier 2 Center into the NASA. And we're planning our first major um, project funded hardware deployment um, this fall. Um, 
So here, for instance, is, this is West West building out the new engineer. He's a great guy. I mean, some of you all get some help. We, we've been we've been in contact. We've been a great deal of contact with, with, with Sean, with Benjamin, and with Brad. We're going to continue that, and we're going to look for ways to collaborate in as many ways as we possibly can. Um, yeah, this is this is actually Orrin Krieger's cluster. Orrin Krieger is is the chief of the Mass Open Cloud project at Boston University, and it's a collaboration with Boston. He's the lead person. He wants to contribute this SAP cluster into Massimo. So already they haven't spent a penny of hardware, but already there's racks of racks of storage are appearing here. Put this in Massimo. And so this is this is a hopeful sign for. for yeah, and so uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about a little bit about um, both the parts of the, the interest in this project. Motivation for it and the potential to growth for growth of the project itself and of cyber infrastructure northeast uh, is depending on what's going on in around, in around Boston and the research wise. And um, <clears throat> that's one of the things we're going to discuss in this in this meeting. It's it's actually kind of there's everybody knows there's a lot going around uh, scientifically in Boston, but I think this is. How much is actually going on is underappreciated, even by the Boston. So I'm going to give a quick tour of, of things that are going on now in and around Boston. So here is, roughly speaking, walking distance from my office. So we find this is the University of Massachusetts, this is Boston College, Boston University, Boston University, MIT, Harvard, Tufts, and over here is like now screen is Brandeis. All, all within walking distance. It's really an amazing place. Hospitals, some of the finest research hospitals in the world are here. There are 15 hospitals, 15 or so hospitals, all in the same area, all within walking distance. Just last night in my Facebook feed, um, I saw something uh, Boston Women, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, that they think after working for 20 years, they may have figured out how to. How to grow the human blood. Um, and if you look at the ratings, some of the finest hospitals in the world are exactly at the same place we're talking about. Here. And they're going to be included in that in the meeting as well. So these are biotech companies, all also within walking distance. So here you see 18 biotech companies. This is Google's only picking up the ones in the papers. There's actually about 20 more companies offspring from the Western suburbs. Google is Google is in Boston. Microsoft is in Boston. I don't know if Charles is there. They have a big center there. Red Hat is also in Boston. The Red Hat Summit was just in Boston. I went to it a couple of weeks ago at the Boston Convention Center. <laughs> Nvidia, also in Boston. Facebook, of course, started in Harvard. They, they have offices also in Boston. Intel is also in Boston. They have offices in Boston. Also, research, Dell EMC, also here. General Electric has just moved their headquarters, did they just broke the ground up their headquarters, also in Boston, and they seem to do everything. The Broad Institute is right across the river. The Broad, Broad is, those, these are the guys who invented CRISPR. The gene splicing technique that's going to change everything for all, all of humanity. They're, they're working on some of the most important things that are happening in human research. National priority research, absolutely. So, the people working on solving the problem of antibiotic resistance bacteria. So, the millions and millions of people don't have to die. Uh, CRISPR based diagnostic, diagnostic programs, antibiotic, biotic resistant tuberculosis. I hope somebody solved that. If they do, it's very likely that it's very aggressive. Uh, the Human Cell Atlas Project, sort of analogous to the Human Genome Project. Microbiome therapies <clears throat> to, to, solve, uh, to solve cases of sebum. This is, they want, they want to collect people's poop, by the way. <laughs> Volunteers. <clears throat> Lincoln Labs is there. This is one of the biggest defense labs in, in the United States. Also, also walking distance. 
I, I hear they have huge resources. I saw their numbers because I don't think I'm allowed to know. Uh, Northeastern has been really active. Northeastern University just started this global resilience institute study, trying to study the infrastructure of the world and seeing if they're how resilient they are to climate change into whatever horrible disaster they may be coming our way. Tim Burgers Lee is in Boston, in charge of the W3 for you. Sarah Seeger, Exoplan, part of the, the Exoplan, um, Travis One. That's a lot of the people working on that are, are, are also in, in the neighborhood, also in the market. David Cox is working on neurobiology. Billy Moon, Travis One, Exoplanets. <clears throat> Jer uh, the Juno Mission to Jupiter. Jeremy Bloxham. Eric Katsuranis will, <coughs> he's speaking at the actual HBC Futures meeting. <coughs> he's one of the main <coughs> one of the main people, people in the black hole collision experiment in LIGO, which had of course an enormous success that everybody knows about. Stephen Wolfram lives in the neighborhood. He's coming in giving a talk. <coughs> Mark Hamilton from NVIDIA will talk about deep learning and AI. Marseille Crosses will talk about the quantitative social science and the universe project. John Manorfelli was uh, Ben Fredelli, uh, was at Google, but he's also been hired by Northeastern to head the new cybersecurity project. All of them, all of them. The Northeastern team, he'll be, he'll be giving a talk. Jason Dit Dittman, he's a young guy, and he, but he was in charge of the, he led the group discovered the best exoplanet. So this is a habitable zone exoplanet that is so close that within a few years they're going to be able to actually measure the atmosphere. And therefore know whether there's life or not. Um, and all those hospitals, Mark, uh, Mark Michael Ski is going to come and sort of summarize the research beginning going on in hospitals. James Cuff <clears throat> will come and talk about research computing at Harvard. I can't resist this. So James suddenly announced that he was retiring. He's a very young guy. And his last day of retirement is June 30th, which happened to be the last, the same thing as Harvard. So I couldn't resist. So he's giving a talk at this conference. But I've never seen somebody give a talk on their last day of work before retirement. And you don't want to miss that. <laughs> So, uh, if you want to come to this meeting, we'll be there. Uh, Oren Krieger, he's, uh, he's the chief guy for the, for, for the NASA Open Cloud Project. Uh, you know, he's a real star in computer science. He's going to be sort of summarizing computer science. David Coker will be summarizing uh, computational science at Boston University. He's a chemist. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, whoops, and that's it. <laughs> I mean, how slow that was. Oh, that's really good. Good. So, so it, I guess in summary, summary, I would say that the potential, the motivation, and the potential for growth, both for Nessie and for cyber infrastructure in the Northeast, regional cyber infrastructure, are shared just like that, just like that we share today, and just, just exactly the way Sean is talking about in the future. We expect storage is going to be shared, computing is going to be shared, in, a, in a, at least a regional sense. The, the, the ground for this happening is extremely fertile and in prospects for Nessie and for this cyber infrastructure. Uh, very, very, very strong. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much for Any plans for creating a deal redundant or a high availability environment? We have a large collection of data. <laughs> Yeah, we're in this. We're we definitely have to do something about that. <laughs> one of the big problems, I mean, one of the big motivations for this kind of facility is sort of an un, unsolved problem in society, which is who curates the research data of the world? Nobody's doing that. It's like it's like the human race is a person who has never learned about backing up, backing up. Somebody's got to do that. And it seems to me that a very natural role for regional cyber infrastructure centers like the ones you've got when you move building here, we're building here, and everybody's bringing up in other places. 
is guaranteeing the existence of important data for perpetuity. So we don't have a technical solution to that. There are many possibilities, but that's certainly a role that we're going to look at very carefully once we get uh, once we get things up and going. Referencing your slide about your, your first uh, SF cluster, yes. um, you had some interesting caching going on and, and something about a distributed energy service. And how much of this is SAP and how much of this is something else? And, and you mean that, that diagram of the cluster? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very specific research cluster that Lauren Greenberg is, is co he's collaborating with Red Hat on. So there's a $5 million uh, uh, grant that Red Hat is collaborating with Red Hat is going to Boston University, and that's one of the main projects. And that's a research cluster, and it's, they're doing all sorts of new things, and they have six terabytes of special cash per rack. So, so there's some technologies in there. It's experiment. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can point you to a paper, it's not quite published yet. But okay. In fact, you should come and visit us. <laughs> we, can, we can talk more on that. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's really, that's uh, not production stuff. That's a research stuff. Other questions? Yeah. I was thinking, maybe we can talk. Thanks all once again before we.